Welcome everybody. Thanks for dropping in or for being here and uh, in the Zoom room. Lovely to share a practice with you. My name is Jill and I'm uh, honored to be one of the Dharma teachers with True North Insight. Hmm. So I was uh, inspired today to share some insights from a book called My Stroke of Insight. And uh, some of you may have heard of this. <laughs> it's, it's one of those time things, how time is so relative. But when I looked at like when this was actually written, I was like, whoa, some of you may be haven't weren't even born, <laughs> which is very weird. Uh, but this uh, book, My Stroke of Insight, was uh, written in 2009, I believe. And uh, it's um, I'll put the link down below in YouTube, and it's here in the chat, from uh, Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor. And um, in 1996, uh, so Dr. Bolte-Taylor uh what is still a brain scientist and at the at this when this uh, story begins um she's 37 years old and um she just describes it so well there's also a great ted talk i'll put the link below where she is she it's just so evocative how she describes her this direct experience but uh she had a massive stroke in the left side of her brain the left hemisphere and in this uh because of her uh, so many factors but because of her awareness and her curiosity about the workings of the brain she was really able to have some attention to what was happening as it was happening and she describes it really well and in this period this four window four hour window of time she um couldn't couldn't walk couldn't talk couldn't read write or recall any of her life and this happened during this four hour window of time and uh, hmm, it took her eight years to recover uh, in her descriptions. And when, when this uh, stroke happened in the left side of her brain, her the right side of her brain became dominant. And she describes her experience and the brain science about this right hemisphere of the brain as being it's, it's so related to meditation it everything is related to meditation but <laughs> this this state of, um, is very much like some meditative states can be where it's fully in the present moment here and now and the the experience and knowing comes a lot through imagery rather than words and, and embodiment, very kinesthetic, knowing through all of the sense doors, not just cognitive knowing, but really awake through all of the sense doors and knowing um, really becomes expanded in that way. And this experience, direct knowing of interconnectedness, um, she also describes it as a sense of perfection that every everybody, including that all all everything was whole and beautiful, and kind of seeing the perfection you know what it reminded me of what's sometimes called buddha nature this this mm, uh reflection that that all all beings have this perfect buddha nature and and 
we get confused along the way. <laughs> we get caught and hooked into painful states. Um, she also describes it as being boundless as part of that interconnectedness and an experience of silence in that there wasn't the constant verbal narration of everything that's going on, which I can totally relate to and I imagine you can as well. She also describes it as Nibbana or Nirvana. Mm. That's her words. And, and so conversely, what, what is known about the left hemisphere of the brain is that, that it's linear. So the right side is, is spatial and here and now present moment. And the left side is more associated with linear thinking, methodical thinking, um, and refers to past and future. References past and projects into future. And, um, and, and from that organizes and associates and categorizes, you know, I, I can just really relate to all of that. And it's that ongoing brain chatter, this constant narration. Like if you go on a meditation retreat, it could you just feel like you're gonna lose your mind because you that's when you actually stop and can hear this constant narration, constant commentary and chatter that's like, oh please. And that's where people come to meditation and say, I just want to learn how to turn it off. <laughs> like, eh, be careful what you wish for. Um, and also the left hemisphere is what is associated with and gives the experience of I am, a sense of separateness. I'm here, you're there, what I want is there, what I don't want is there, this sense of separate individual self compared to the right brain, which is interconnected, boundless, spacious present moment, all these different qualities. Uh, it's just uh, so relatable. So in her direct experience of this and also her study of the brain and fascination with these things, but also, but then her actually living through it. And the, this, when she was really working on her recovery, she made very intentional and conscious choices of, about how much of, how much she wanted to recover that left brain life. <laughs> Maybe some of you can relate to that. She didn't want to, she wanted to be able to remember how to feed herself, brush her teeth and how to walk how to read and write, you know, how to have these left brain functions on board, but didn't want to lose that sense of interconnectedness and boundlessness and um, peace, uh, silence. Yeah. And so she says in this, uh, this, book um the portion of my left mind that i chose not to recover was the part of my left hemisphere character that had the potential to be mean to worry incessantly or to be verbally abusive either to myself or others frankly i just didn't like the way these attitudes felt physiologically inside my body can we relate to that? My chest felt tight. I could feel my blood pressure rise and the tension in my brow would give me a headache. And in addition, I wanted to leave behind any of my old emotional circuits that automatically stimulated the instant replay of painful memories. I have found life to be too short to be preoccupied with the pain of the past. During the process of recovery, I found that the portion of my character that was stubborn, 
arrogant, sarcastic, or jealous resided within this ego center of that wounded left brain. And this portion of my ego mind held the capacity for me to be a sore loser, and to hold a grudge, to tell lies, and to even seek revenge. Reawakening these personality traits was very disturbing to the newly found innocence of my right mind. And with lots of effort, underline that, lots of effort, I have occasionally, I have consciously chosen to recover my left mind's ego center without giving renewed life to some of these old circuits. There's just so much to unpack in there. Just, but it's, uh, can we, can you relate to, you know, the, this uh, mm, incessant worrying mind? Anybody else have that besides me? <laughs> or this constant narration or categorizing, judging ourselves and others? Mm, unkind words to ourselves and others, either internally or externally, whether we say them or not. Um, and the the beautiful thing is that we don't have to have go through such a dramatic, painful experience. It, she she says I I didn't write it down, but I I'm, I I read or heard her saying that. Um, wish I could find it right now, but uh, that she was grateful for this experience and what it taught her. So she she wouldn't like choose not to have this. But it's also good to know that we don't have to have this experience to gain these insights and to learn from the power of meditation, the power of insight. And hmm, so she shares a very important piece here around brain science. I don't know. I usually am citing um, suttas more than science, but it's this is also helpful and fun. And uh, so this is important. She says, although there are certain emotional programs that can be triggered automatically, have we noticed this? <laughs> It takes less than, less than 90 seconds for one of these programs to be triggered and to surge through our body and then to be completely flushed out of our bloodstream. Less than 90 seconds. Now, most of us are probably like, that's not how it rolls for me. <laughs> how often does a trigger just like, just move through in a span of 90 seconds. Hmm. Often, not the case. Maybe 90 days. <laughs> For some folks, 90 years. Definitely, you know, we can hold on to things for a long time. Um, so to understand that these things can be set off automatically by so many variables and we're not going to try to m manipulate our lives to control all the external conditions so that we're never triggered because a that's not how it works and it's that would be impossible and cause a lot more suffering the because of ancestry conditioning racism oppression classism, uh, karma, deep grooves and sankaras and conditioning, we're, we get triggered. And once triggered, the chemical released, she goes on, by my brain surges through my body and I have a physiological experience. Yes, right? We get tension or heart mm, clenches or 
blood pressure rises, our gut gets tense. We can have all kinds of physiological responses. Um, and this is part of, it's not just this brain, but the whole spinal cord. It's all one living system. So we can't separate what happens in the body from the brain. Um, now she says, if, however, I remain angry after those 90 seconds have passed, then it is because I have chosen to let that circuit run. Moment by moment, I make the choice to either hook in to my, you know, and to move back into the present moment or and allow that reaction to melt away as fleeting physiology. <laughs> she makes it sound so easy, right? Uh, and here's where the Dharma comes in. Uh, because it's really interesting to just keep this in mind, like just write 90 seconds around. I use post-it notes a lot. And check it out for yourself. Just like count. Count in 90 it, and that can seem really slow. <laughs> when you're activated, 90 seconds, you're like, oh, you know, they say count to 10, but here, count to 90. And see what happens. And so the first, the first, these are the wise efforts. If you like uh, studying the, the suttas, uh, the, the teachings of the, of the Buddha, this is in the Majjhima Nikaya, number 20. And it's, um, it's around the wise effort to abandon what is unskillful. So unskillful means, hmm, well, you know, the things where we're in reactivity and we might speak, act, think harshly, cruelly, unskillfully. So when we're hooked into a body-mind state that is... Um, harmful we have we have a lot of agency and a lot of tools about how to work skillfully with that the first of these is mindfulness and this is where this 90 seconds uh um is at play to just be mindful like whoa that's that's running through. There's all these thoughts and there's all this activation. Okay, I'm just going to not not hit send on that email. I'm not going to say that right now. I'm not going to even buy that or eat that or whatever for 90 seconds. And I'm just going to pay attention. How does this feel? Whoa, what's happening? And feel all the activation that's happening in the body and sometimes if not often that may be enough to just let it run its course to move through the system and dissipate truly then um in this in this sutta majjhima nikaya 20 it uh i'm wanting to know the title of it i'm just gonna flip to it it's right here oh, okay it's not not so helpful it's called the removal of distracting thoughts in that's the translation of it anyways um Okay, so after mindfulness and the 90 seconds, if we find then we're still hooked, we're still activated, we're still, <laughs> yeah, all, all the things, okay? Then the, the teachings are to apply the opposite as an antidote. So if we're triggered by greed and we're really hooked in it, then we might practice generosity or gratitude. If we're hooked in uh, ill will or 
mm, thoughts of anger, we might then practice its opposite, metta or loving kindness. May I be peaceful, may I be safe, may I be well, etc. Or to others um, in that practice. Uh, if we're mm, experiencing any kind of suffering, we might practice a, a compassion practice. If there's envy, jealousy, then we would practice the opposite of mudita. These are all Brahma Vihara meditation practices that I can't go into in depth tonight. But so just try to identify what is the mind state and what would its opposite be? And then give attention to cultivating, growing that state. And then sometimes we find we're still hooked and the mind is still wanting to grind away on something and fuel it, you know, the fuel. Watch out for the fuel. I, when I, I actually picture myself with like a, a, a can of kerosene just pouring some fuel onto onto something that's already burning it's like why why am i doing that adding fuel to it because it feels good and then i feel justified they're that and i'm this and they should have and i you know it feels good sometimes to fuel these things but the next antidote then is to examine the danger in it. Examine to look closely and see this is causing my own affliction, my own suffering and harm. It's like the, especially with ill will, um, the Buddha describes it as picking up a hot coal to throw at someone else. It's burning us. And uh, so to examine, like just to see oh you're you're actually really afraid are you yes uh -huh. you know look a little more closely unpack it a little bit um and to see the danger in it really is what it's about see how it's gonna it's causing you harm and it's probably going to cause others harm i can relate to that <laughs> It's so easy to just vent on somebody else or to whatever, you know, if we're not aware. Very easy. Okay, and then sometimes we're still hooked. Like we're way past the 90 seconds and, and we've tried to apply, you know, that, that um, the antidote, the opposite as an antidote. We've investigated the danger in it a little bit but the mind still says yeah but and wants to keep holding on to it in whatever way then the teachings say wise diversion this requires and the words in the teaching really use a lot of effortful words the wise diversion uh, recommended is often the body where is the body? What's the body doing? Am I actually walking in a forest, but my mind is back there in that argument or projecting what I'm going to say? Or, you know, where where are you? Are you? Can you feel your body? Uh, so, kind of dropping down out of this this head activity and really feeling embodied, perhaps feeling the breath or some some touch. Uh, can be helpful feeling your feet on the ground um, noticing what the body's doing most of the time we're doing something unless we're meditating we don't usually sit still and do not do activities we're usually on the go on the go well where what am I actually doing oh actually washing dishes can I actually wash this dish and just be with washing this dish. So this is wise diversion. And of course, Buddha being oh, such a wise being uh, knew directly that sometimes we're still hooked. You know, these things can go on for weeks or years. And uh, 
certainly for hours. So um, the next two mm, are similar. W one is called stilling the thought formation. So <clears throat> it's described well here. I'm just aware of the time. So I'm going to wrap up in a moment. Hang on. Uh, I'm just going to read you this because it's it's very interesting, this one. Stilling the thought formation. I like it. Uh, it's described like this. Each one of them has a wonderful simile. I wish I could go into it. So he gives this like a image, which I find helpful. Uh, so just as a per person walking fast might, might consider, why am I walking fast? What if I walk slowly? And one might walk slowly and then might consider, why am I walking slowly? What if I stand? And then considering, so it's really just re, redirecting the mind to stilling the thought formations to see what's activated and what would be soothing, what would be calming, stilling of these fueling thoughts. And the last one, <laughs> it's also, also described so well. Now, this comes with a big asterisk. We don't begin with the last of these. This is the last resort. Do not begin here because if you do, that's suppression and spiritual bypassing and repression and all kinds of unskillfulness. Uh, it's described like this. It's very strong language. Okay. So each of the paragraphs, it begins this way. If while one is giving attention to stilling the thought formation, which is the one before of those thoughts, and there still is a rising evil and wholesome thoughts connected with desire, hate, and delusion, then, last resort, with teeth clenched and tongue pressed against the roof of the mouth, one should beat down constraint and crush the mind with the mind. <laughs> if anyone read that out of context, it would it would not go well. Remember, this is after we've been mindful and practicing Brahma Vihara, examining how it's harmful to us, diverting the attention, paying attention to the body. And then sometimes we notice we're just still hooked. And that's when we have to just say no. If that's just like a hard line, stop. I, I, I often need to do this and I just say stop, nope. I also do this if like a, mm, a a scary image comes into the mind or a scary thought or I catch, you know, like a preview of something that's scary and I just go, stop, nope, we're not going to fuel that. That's a hard no, because I just know, I've been there, been there, done that. I know where that's going to go if I let my imagination just roll away. Um, so this vigorous restraint is the last resort where we just have to hardline it, not doing that anymore. Please remember, we don't begin there. So this teaching, together with the insights of Jill Bolt Taylor's stroke of insight, as she calls it, shows us that we do have so many tools to choose To choose what we are going to fuel and grow and pay attention to. Is it skillful, onward leading, wholesome, kind, generous, etc.? Hmm. I think that's it. Uh, let me just see. Mm hmm. So, 
I do. I I don't just say this to people. I do this myself. I put post-its a, a, around and I put like this week, I'll be putting 90 seconds. I'm going to put one in my car. I might put one on my phone. I might put one by my bedside. So I see it when I wake up. I just put them around 90 seconds. And so it just keeps it up, keeps it up. And practice with it this week. See what see what comes for you. You might find it very liberating. Mm, so now we get to practice, which is what it's about. <laughs> okay, so set aside any distractions if you like. You might like to mm, adjust your posture, uh, adjust your lighting. Some people like to turn away from the computer. Hmm. And just let my I I do tend towards exuberance when I'm talking about the Dharma, so that's probably a lot of energy. Just like the 90 seconds, just let it dissipate, let all that fall away. All those words and concepts and ideas can just dissolve. And trust that what is resonant for you will will land. Don't need to hold on to any of it. And then let the body settle into this right hemisphere awareness here and now, here now. So that when you feel pulled into past or future, you can just know that as one part of the activity of the mind. And right now we're going to cultivate just here now. And to do this, we'll let the attention settle through and uh, suffuse the body. All that language and words activating up in the head. We just let it all settle down through every cell of the body. Start to wake up. Feel the muscles of the face soften. Might feel helpful to take a few sighing breaths. See if there's any tension in the Shoulders that could soften or let go or lengthen. So the shoulders drop down. If you're taking a few slightly deeper breaths, you might feel some softness through the or some movement in the area of the chest or the belly mm. 
Let awareness suffuse the arms and hands and just feel the touch of air and the touch of where the hands are, are resting. You might feel textures, temperature. Tingling sensations or pulse or in the hands and fingers. Feel the weight of the body and the touch of the body with the surface that you're on, contact, pressure. And then we can practice connecting with this whole body awareness. And this can extend beyond the physical form and the, the skin. You might feel it like a sphere of awareness around the whole body, all directions. And then just this field of awake awareness is knowing the body right now. Within this field of awake awareness embodied, all of the sense doors are awake and receiving sense impressions. Smell. Sounds, touch, taste. And see if to whatever degree is available, it might be just a slight inkling. Mm. That left hemisphere might come in and compare and contrast and criticize. But see if you can just touch into this sense of wholeness that is possible for all of us sense of beauty, even perfection. Perfect in, with our imperfections, perfectly imperfect.
And by now you may have noticed that the chatter also comes in. The referencing past and future. And that is not a problem. It's not something we want to abandon within ourselves. We just want to know. Ah, oh, thinking is happening. Planning is happening. Remembering is happening. And we don't need to feed that right now. Right now we're just practicing here, now. Here now. And if you notice at some point some activation, some trigger that feels related to ill will towards ourselves or others, or wanting, not wanting, We're just spacing out. See if it has a lifespan longer than 90 seconds. Or does it just come up and move through and pass away when we let it be? And then for this second half of the meditation, if you choose, we could now cultivate the opposite as an antidote and take some time to practice with this loving kindness meditation. Cultivating friendliness and kind wishes. And skillful mind states feeling embodied here and now let this aspiration suffuse the whole body may I be happy May I be safe. May I be well. May I be peaceful. And as you keep softly repeating these internally, Really feeling that as a felt experience as much as possible, growing these kind and skillful thoughts. May I be happy. May I be safe. May 
May I be well. May I be peaceful. When we notice distraction, gently coming back, feeling the body, here and now, may I be happy. May I be safe. May I be as well as possible. May I be peaceful. And still cultivating present moment of bodied awareness, we can also connect to a sense of spaciousness, boundlessness, interconnectedness. So you might just feel into the space of the room that you're in. Without even needing to open the eyes or look around, we can feel the space between the body and the walls and the ceiling, the space behind us. And let this kind awareness Suffuse all of that space. May I be happy. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be peaceful. Feeling as if you're held in, floating in. That spacious, whole, beautiful, boundless, awake awareness.
embodied present moment, all the sense doors, spacious and boundless. Allow the attention to rest with and follow these three bells through till their ending to close the practice. Thank you for your practice, and um, I hope there's something fruitful and insightful for you there to continue practicing with, and uh, I'll check the links below to um, the sutta and book that uh, I referenced tonight, and uh, hope to practice with you again.